I think when done right, a digital initiative empowers your people to make more accurate and effective decisions by bridging the gap between disparate systems. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about the benefits of manufacturing digitalization. And to help us walk through this conversation, we have Bill Migradich, who is the Manufacturing Solutions Manager at Rovasis. So welcome, Bill. Hey, Chris. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you. I'm excited to have this conversation with you, Bill. Thank you, first of all, for taking the time with us to walk us through this. So maybe get us started. So explaining to that listener out there who's not familiar with manufacturing digitalization, what is that? How would you explain that topic? So great question. And there's a lot of answers to that question. So at its core, to me, that statement generally means the utilization of digital information to optimize your operational performance. And I know that sounds fairly generic, so I I got a couple examples to, to run past you. So obviously for the recording here, we focus in manufacturing and that's where most of my answers are coming from that background. So if you consider a manufacturing operation that produces something, whether it's a discrete a batch operation or something that's hybrid. In most all of those operations, you're going to find common operational systems for management of orders, production, quality, process, and even the automation as we all kind of on this call are very familiar with. And in many cases, the information from those often disparate systems are used in a collective manner to run an operation. When you talk about manufacturing digitalization, in my experience and in my team's experience, It's the task of putting those sources together to be more effective. So, for example, let's say you have a production scheduler who's managing a week's time for orders, and and they might look at a lot of things in order to plan when to make things through the plan. They might look at literally the schedule. What do we have to make? When is it due out the door? They may also talk to their peer groups like maintenance and quality in case there's things that they need to do to make sure that production plan goes through as planned. And so to give you a detailed point, they may do something like look at the maintenance system to make sure that the line that he or she is planning to use isn't scheduled for a major teardown. And so with that example in mind, in the digital world, the way you can approach that would be to do something like when you set down to do the schedule and, and scheduling alone can be digitized. You'd be surprised the number of places that don't do that. But when that scheduler sits down, that person could then have their scheduling system look at the maintenance solution to say at their maintenance system, something like a Maxima or, you know, SAP, and look at the assets that are intended for that order and simply check to see, hey, is this line free to be used or is it on schedule takedown kind of thing? That's one very basic example. So here's another one. Let's say you're operating a plant that's processing like natural materials through a variety of assets and it requires frequent offline checks to make sure that when we make the product or we run the process, it's having the intended effect on the product's condition or its attribute. An attribute would be the things you're trying to put into the product. So whether it's color or size or whatever it is. And in many cases today, that often involves a lot of disparate, separate pieces of work going on where somebody might, I'll give you a worst case. So you run the line, line runs, quality might come out and grab some of it, take it back, check it, look at it and go, well, that's not quite great. And, and in the meantime, that line back there, just cranking away, making the same thing over and over and over and repeating possibly the same mistakes. And so in a digitalized world, you might take that situation and tie that information together. So the line's running, the quality person goes out and grabs a sample and notates electronically when that sample is taken. Quality does their work. Their data, literally the data they get in the lab, gets recorded to their limb system against data from their process historian. And it says, okay, when you produce this sample in this cup and it has these attributes and these attributes are due to the process conditions that I'm pulling right out of the historian. Very, very basic example. And I'll, I'm going to tell you a, a, an actual story about that later on in the, in the discussion here. But 
that's a very basic example of digitalization, just using what you know. Now, of course, digitalization, people also talk about IIoT as well, and I'll talk about more of that a little bit later. But those examples I'm giving really kind of are framed in the on-premise situation. There's no reason why that information and, and those solutions and tying all that stuff together cannot go outside the operation and leverage some web-based utility or tool or thing of that nature. Right. So, I mean, the things like scheduling and that quality piece, are they traditionally done now via other means, just more human direct interaction? Yeah. And in my experience, it depends on where you go. If you go to the to bigger companies, more of the Fortune 100s, the 500s, those are the people that probably have, if you take, for example, scheduling, those are the people that probably have made the investment, gone out on the curve and said, hey, we're going to go through and, and implement more of an automated scheduling planning solution that can look at the orders and to tell you literally, hey, based on a number of factors, whether it's the line, the size of the order requirements, how we make that. And so as you get and start to turn the focus back towards mid-tier and smaller companies who may not have the means to implement a big formal tool like that, they often end up using, we could, we could all guess, it's, it's a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet exercise. Somebody sits down, they got a spreadsheet that gets handed to them, gets spit out of the ERP system, and they hand it to you and they go, Chris, here you go. Here's everything we got to get made by Friday. How about it? That's pretty common. And that's pretty common for a lot of things beyond scheduling. can be quality a number of things. Yep. Gotcha. But okay, that, that definitely painted a much better picture for me. So if I'm in that environment, how are you seeing that technology evolve that's directly impacting things like that? Yeah. So, and not to dwell on scheduling, but there's tools that do that kind of thing automatically. So smart AI type tools that can look both at your schedule and the demands of your schedule, the things you got to make. And it looks at your assets and key variables about your assets and your operation could be basic things like, is the asset available? Does it have the capacity to produce what you're asking it to make? Do you have to go out to other departments to produce that, such as quality, and are they ready? And these are literally attributes that a, an automated scheduling system can just say, yeah, you got it or you don't have it. And it'll sit there and that AI engine will crank away and determine that. Now, in terms of how the technology is evolving more down toward the manufacturing floor, usually the way I like to start with that is to start talking about IIoT and go up from there. And, and in terms of what the technology is doing as it relates to the equipment and down at sort of like the level zero, level one, especially with IIoT, I think the biggest thing that has changed and has evolved with those sciences and offerings is that the host of low cost smart devices that make it a lot more effective and easier to go and gather information about your operation or a line or a piece of equipment and get that information back. There's such a plethora of hardware on the market today that's cost effective, smart, anywhere ranging from simple to smart. So inexpensive, like in your world, it's just inexpensive IO or smart sensors that can go out and do the work, crunch the numbers and hand a result back to a cloud-based tool that can say, Here's your information. Here's what's, here's what's going on with the equipment. I, I think right now, the thing that, those are a couple of the things that I feel like are really helping evolve and impact that whole approach of, you know, smart manufacturing. Right. Now, how about you're in a lot of these environments talking with the end users? What are you seeing people get most excited or amped up about as they're evolving towards digitalization? I think what gets people the most excited is the possibility of what they could do. So when you sit down with somebody, when often we do this, we talk to folks and they say, we wanna explore this manufacturing digitalization opportunity. That's more on the early stage curve that somebody coming in and say, hey, I've heard the term, I wanna know what I can do with this. Now, at the same time, we talk to people who are at any number of locations along that journey, starting from, I've heard the term, I don't know what it is, what can I do with it? All the way up to people who have said, hey, we've got a committee, we're looking at digital manufacturing, and we've got some ideas in mind. So when I talk about the possibility of what they could do, oftentimes I think the thing that gets people the most excited is we will go to them and say, well, what do you, forget the technology, just forget it. What are you trying to fix? As you sit down with your planning teams on a monthly or whatever basis, 
what comes out of those meetings that you're being asked to drive improvement with? And when we sit and we talk to those people about those objectives, what they do today to hit those goals and the tools they use, and oftentimes it's, like I said earlier, spreadsheets, word of mouth, emails, data that has to be stuck together to make a decision. When you start to put a vision in their head about, well, here's what you could do given what you have today and just simply getting a digital initiative together to get the information to the right people at the right time, something we've all heard that theme, all the way to let's take what you have today. When I say what you have, I mean like your systems, your automation, your quality system, your production system, your historians, the things that deliver valuable information. And we augment them with other technologies to help you achieve what you want to do. Here's how we think it'll help you drive change. And so the, I think the thing that gets people the most excited is when we come in, because we, as an integration partner, we talk and deal with a lot of people. And as a result of doing that, it helps us be a more valuable resource to people to say, well, let me tell you about what these guys did. Had very similar situation and yeah, that kind of thing. So it's the possibility of what they could do. Right. The, the note I, I wrote down to stand out to me is, is you're painting the vision of possibilities. And whatever that right. may be for wherever they may currently be, you know, because everybody's at a different starting point, as you mentioned. But looking for, I guess that that's where the, the, the magic happens, right? Being able to paint that vision and really connect the dots. And I know sometimes when you start connecting dots, headwinds come up and people see hurdles and sometimes they get overwhelmed. Like, oh man, I can't do this. Speak to that person who may be out there listening right now to some realities out there around those headwinds and hurdles. Sure, yeah. When I think about the hurdle topic, I think the thing that comes to mind often is the cost related to a digital project and the rationalization of what it's going to do for the operation. What we sometimes see in the market, especially because all this stuff is technology-based, is People get excited about the technology and don't give enough thought to what is that going to deliver for you? I mean, it's great to say, and I think we all know what people don't put in technology these days like they did 20 years ago for the sake of putting in technology. So one of the hurdles is, is really about how do you justify what you're trying to do? And I, I call it define before you design. In other words, find out what objectives you're trying to improve and throw the properly sized solution at the objective to make sure that you get a win. So it's the cost versus the benefit and the impact. The other hurdle is we have a term we use within our IMES and digital supply chain group. We call it the customer maturity. And we don't mean that negatively. We mean it by, to give you an example, if you hand a solution that's too technically complex to an organization or an operation, a geographic location, that doesn't have the training in place, the training methodologies, the knowledge base in place to support it, you're sort of heading for a train wreck. So, because people are gonna, they're not gonna use it, they're gonna stumble with it and it will soon atrophy, they won't use the tool. So that, that's a hurt, it's, it's right sizing the solution for the people. So there's ways of assessing and adjusting for that. Right, and that's for a smaller operation that's out there, if they're wanting to right size that project, and maybe look at more incremental areas of impact, what guidance or advice would you give them? For a company of any size, the project, and it, big and large, and especially more toward a smaller operation, because I think this has a bigger impact, is you have to have clear improvement goals with a project of this type, technology-related project. So whether it's reduce waste, reduce off quality, increase performance, meet the needs of a regulatory requirement. So identifying what it's gonna do, what is this thing gonna change? And then secondly, a really big thing that's important is leadership engagement. Leadership has to be committed to the solution, the concept, whatever it is they're gonna put in place and be willing to give people the time to put it to work, put it to practice on a daily basis. So as they meet daily, they're gonna look at that solution and the information that comes from it and say, hey, this thing is showing us something about how we did. How are we gonna adjust and take that data or that information or those metrics? How are we gonna do things differently? Because what it will do, what these technology solutions will do is they will show you what you're doing wrong. And, and that's kind of a general statement, but 
there are solutions out there that you, you, you put it into place, you turn it on, it's going to give me information you, you didn't have, and you, or you may have been measuring manually. For example, we see this all the time. You put in a tool to measure something. They've been doing it in the past, maybe with a spreadsheet or manually, and now the information is coming back and it's different. And one of the biggest challenges we have with people is to say, okay, first of all, we want you to know that you trust what you're reading. And you go, okay, well, we might not like the answer, but yes, it's something different. And so typically what we do, especially with smaller operations, is we, we say, okay, let's watch that for a while, or a month, two months, and watch that baseline. And you might even compare it to your manual method to the point where you say, okay, we believe the information. Now start using it. I love it. Well, I mean, there were some great points there, understanding where that, that customer sits from a maturity standpoint. But I really like what you said, being clear on the goals, on what those improvement goals are, but the leadership engagement, they have to have that buy-in. So I go back to earlier in the discussion, you were talking about define before you design. I think you're all over. That's coffee cup worthy right there, man, Bill. That's that's awesome. <laughs> As soon as I get off this call, I'm going to have those made. So. There you go. You get one made and send it to us. We'll throw eco as well on the other side. We'll be good to go. So Absolutely. when you're talking about these smaller projects and we're trying to get that buy-in, people to embrace and, and really shift the culture to where, okay, we like this. This is working really great. We just need more of it. And sometimes those smaller projects, they can be the beachheads. So mm. how could someone out there who's thinking about these projects really begin to, to put a plan together to, Hey, this could be something bigger, but I need to start small. So I'll give you a two part answer. And the two part answer sort of mirrors what I just said in the, in the previous question. So n number one, if you identify a beachhead, obviously you've got some idea where you want to go, but find one that has an achievable set of success metrics for what it's going to do so that the project can produce real results and that it, you get a win essentially. And it's, a quick win up front and that the people who own the issue quickly and clearly identify, okay, if we put this in, what is it going to expose and what is it going to help us change? And that might be two or three things, you know, so if let's take unplanned downtime on a line that's got a lot of sections to it and you want to put something in to help capture when you stop, why you stop and how often you stop. One goal for that might be to take that information, meet periodically through the week to identify and chase and resolve issues. And that work should help you do something such as decrease the unplanned downtime on the line. So that's part of your success metric. And then the next part of it is engagement and commitment. And so again, using that same example, I would say, okay, you go to this particular line and you're going to get with the operators, the supervisors, the managers, and the people above the managers to say, for the next bit of time, we're going to be taking this information and reacting and making changes based on what we learn. And what that means, folks, is that it might mean that we run Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and at the end of Wednesday, we're going to come up with this list of stuff we saw happen as a result of the new solution. We might come to maintenance and engineering and say, we need two people to go out here and fix this laundry list and do it right away because we're trying a new process to identify what's, what's causing you to stop. And you, you take some different actions to change that issue. And, and that's the engagement part, because all too often what happens is that technology goes in, it exposes what's going on, but the people who are typically required to go out and make the changes, whether it's manufacturing, engineering, or maintenance, they haven't been engaged. And now you're coming back and, hey, I need you to do this. And they're going, well, I can't do that. And that's where the leadership part comes in. I have this term I use, but we're all pulling the rope in the same direction. So you get the team and you get on board. That makes perfect sense. Absolutely. I mean, and so far as the team, kind of perfect segue into where I was hoping to, to ask you about next. Who do you see is typically involved in these types of projects? From the start, usually what we see is when these types of projects have reached, a, let's just say, it's reached a level where the operation of the site or the team said, yeah, we want to do this. We've done our little bit of homework on digital manufacturing. So typically what we see oftentimes is it's it can be a mix. Oftentimes it's somebody with an IT and manufacturing background who has now earned the title of digital manufacturing director. We see senior engineering leadership picking up these responsibilities because oftentimes engineering is expected to drive that kind of change and, and improvement. So 
I think those are two of the most prominent groups, IT and engineering, that pick these up. That, that makes perfect sense. So thanks for sharing that. How about any examples? I know you've been out there working with this technology and these concepts for quite a while. Do any stand out as, hey, this is a really cool project, this customer this end user actually adopted this and saw some really great impact or benefit or improvement, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I picked out three and uh, the first one I'm going to give you, it goes way back, probably 15 years back for me when, it, before I was actually at Rovisys. But in this particular case, we had a client that was a tobacco producer and what they were trying to do was reduce the variability in their processing operation where they process the tobacco. And then what they would do is they're making the product, they're doing things to it, they're throwing things into it. And quality would come out and literally grab a, a scoop, like a bucket of material, bring it back to the quality lab and do their testing to it and test it for its, its attributes. So whether it's moisture or content of different ingredients, whatever it was. And then that information manually was used to go back to the process people and say, well, we took this sample and we tested it and, and um, here's what we got. And so they expect the process engineering to go, well, okay, we, we'll try fixing this and adjusting that. So what we did in that case, and this is very simple, but it was very, very effective, is we went out to the line where the QC tech goes out to take the sample and we installed a digital button that we said, look, when you take this sample, we want you to just take the sample, hit this button. And what that button did is it told their process historian, they just took a sample. And, and at that time, we set it up so that the historian would then go, okay, I'm gonna grab a snapshot of certain process parameters upstream of this location that says, here's what it was, okay? Whether it's, I, and I can't tell you the details, but there's moisture and all these other things that the process would, would have. And then they would take that data and after they did the QC test, they would compare it to the process conditions. So at the end of the day, what it allowed them to do was make a very quick correlation between the, the product's condition and the process that made it. And, and by going through that and working that process, it allowed them to really tighten their process variance and, and gr greatly reduce the variances that caused the product to be different. Another one that will give you relates to OEE solutions. So we get a customer. They made a, a discrete consumer product, and I, and I have to be general because I can't mention their name, but they had an operation where they started using an OEE tool, and they had multiple lines that could make pretty much all of their products. They had a, a fixed set of products that they produced, and, and they could aim them down any one of 10 lines. And it, as they started to use the OEE tool, obviously, they started getting information about the lines, but they also had it configured so that they knew which products they were making. So the OEE data also included job number and product. Over time, what they were able to do is they could take that product information and compare it. So if you took a specific single product, they could say, okay, how does that product run on line one through 10? And does any one line make this better than another one? And they also happen to look at shift too, but let's just stick with the OEE metric. And at the end of the day, what they were able to do by better leveraging that OEE data was to say, when we make this product, it certainly runs better on line five. That's the place to make it. And it also runs horribly on line, say, seven. Now, the way they use that is they said, okay, well, well, let's go to seven and figure out why we don't make it well at seven and fix that. And so the cool thing about that application was inherently OEE, if you use it the right way, it's going to help you just get more uptime and availability and just get more stuff through. It also helped them take the lines that couldn't do it and make those capable. So it was almost like they doubled their capacity effect. They took the lines that made it fine and cranked it up a few digits or percentages, but they also took those lines that didn't always do such a great job and made them more effective. The, uh, the last one I'll give you is more toward, I think it's an interesting example of manufacturing digitalization because it involves an operation that really was a, a yard that processed and produced natural materials, it's pr primary materials. And so the way the place was set up was they produced a product where carriers, like truck drivers, they would come in, they would go to pick up a specific order and be sent to any number of locations on the site. They're expected to get their trucks filled, get through against some specific order, get their trucks filled, get through the operation and get out and get down the road to the customer who uses the product, basically. 
And so the problem they had is that during busy times, they, they'd struggle to get haulers in and efficiently through the operation because everything was done manually on paperwork, like with the orders. So the hauler would be expected to come in, let them know what they're there to pick up, who is it for. The operation, the customer site would then have to go, okay, well, that's this particular order right here. And so the solution we put forth to these folks is we, we said, okay, what we'll do now is when haulers come in, we'll give the truck an RFID tag that gets magnetically stuck on the truck. So we know it's here. It comes through this gate, thing picks it up. We also happen to use license plate readers to identify the truck. So once that gets picked up, then they can assign it. They would electronically assign it right to the order. So now that they know this particular truck is here to pick up this order, the driver would get on a smartphone, they'd get instructions on where to go on their phone. They drive there, they get, their vehicle filled and and in this particular case it was by weight so they get weighed out now where the transformation started to happen is once that happens of course they had adequate automation that when the truck rolled onto the scale they weighed the truck empty they filled it they know how much they put in it the truck drives off the scale but now they also keep in mind now they digitally know what order was that for so now instead of manually processing that order that filled truck was rolling away and the site order goes, okay, you're done. You filled that order. The other thing they did, though, is now they knew the truck was done and it could lead the site. And one of the problems they were having previously was trucks tended to kind of meander around on site, waste time, find time to catch a nap. And the place was busy. I mean, they're very, their business was good. And the faster they could get trucks in, out, and down the road, the better off they'd be and their customers would be better off, especially if, they were, if the end customer was actually busy. So that information was able to give them visibility to, one, help the trucker come in, know what they're there for, know where to go. And once their vehicle's filled, that order could get processed in real time. Now. There's no more paperwork. You just take and say, hey, that order got filled. The ERP system looks at it. And, and by the way, that interaction was cloud-based. We'd take that information about the truck got filled, here's the weight, it's against this order, and here's the carrier. And electronically, we go up to the cloud and exchange that information with their ERP system. Well, now the ERP system has got the information, and the person doing the invoicing can now invoice against it. Now, the other thing they did for the efficiency end of this thing is they would then watch which carriers had a tendency to come in and get slow or not be fast. And on site, they could work on that. It allowed them to assess and monitor and measure where they had trouble and fix those things. So at the end of the day, they could just get people through there faster. Right. Well, no, there, there were three great examples. I, the, the tobacco processing one really stood out to me, mainly because I used to call on some of those processors and I used to see the people go out with the buckets and take the samples and, that was just a really good, it painted a very good picture for me. And then the OEE for sure. But this last one, just the many benefits of that RFID solution just ties it back to quality as well as just production in general, all the different points. So sure. thank you for, for bringing those three out. And, and Bill, this has been a, a wonderful discussion and we call it eco Ask why we always wrap up with the why. So maybe for our listeners out there, can you wrap us up with a good why? Why should manufacturers embrace this digitalization as they look to grow in the future? Yeah, sure. No, and that, that's a great question because look at the end of the day, our customers have to answer that question. And if they can't answer that question, then right, it's going nowhere. So I think when done right, the digital initiative empowers your people to make more accurate and effective decisions by bridging the gap between disparate systems. And, and I say that disparate systems because oftentimes if I had to generalize where some of those hurdles are, it's because you're asking an operation or a site to accomplish a task using separate systems that require a lot of human manual labor and interaction. Now, I'm not saying you don't need that. You definitely need that. There will always be a spot where there's that manual bridge of getting stuff, information from in system A to B. But those digital initiatives, that's really one of the first areas of low-hanging fruit. And then the other area is digitalization has the power to bridge the information gaps that exist between people through manual tasks with systems like quality checks, process checks, like the example I gave you. And also one of those areas being like automated workflow where you're taking 
manual human tasks, whether it's rounds and inspections, something where somebody's walking around with a clipboard and having to go around and assess and measure where the, it's not connected to automation, it's some unconnected thing. So that, that's an area where it's kind of like the, the next frontier for some automation. You're taking what the human does and, and you're not taking the human out. You're just making what they do more effective and more real time. So instead of a piece of paper, it's electronic. They take the data. The data goes somewhere for usage right away. And the form they're using can also tell them, hey, you took a measurement that's so far outside of spec. There's got to be something wrong right. in real time. Exactly. Well, I mean, this has been very helpful. Painted a really good picture about some many benefits that do exist out there for the manufacturers that are listening. Check out Bill. You can go to the show notes. You can see his link. Connect with him directly if you want to learn more. Bill, thank you so much for taking the time for sharing your wisdom, everything that you've shared with our guests today. Thank you. Yeah, it's an exciting space. There's lots of opportunity and appreciate the chance to chat with you about it. Absolutely. We can definitely hear your passion. So no doubt you've done wonderful things and just thank you for everything that you're doing for this industry. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 